Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. My name is Imam Adam Jamal. I am the Director of Education at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, or MAPS, in Redmond, Washington. And I'm going to be joining you all this 2020 summer uh, to introduce Islam. I am uh, an, an Imam, which is a religious leader at, uh, at MAPS, at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. It is the largest mosque in the Northwest. We serve about 5,000 families every year, uh, 5,000 Muslim families. And we have visitors from, from all over the area who come to visit us and, and see us. And you're welcome to, to come by uh, anytime, um, especially after the, uh, the, the COVID-19 situation. Right now we're on a bit of a, uh, we're kind of closed down in, in many ways. So once that's over and once that's all done, then uh, please feel free to come visit us at any time. Um, my, <clears throat> I wanted to start out by letting you know a little bit about myself, my, my background. I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. I uh, grew up there and I wanted to really study my religion and my faith in more detail. And so I, uh, the first step for me was learning Arabic. And so I went overseas to a school in France where they had an Arabic immersion program, as well as an Islamic studies bachelor's. So I did my Arabic studies, I did my bachelor's undergrad uh, there. Um, then I went to the UK and did my master's in education there. Um, I worked in various different um, positions as a teacher or as a, um, as a traveling instructor, all kinds of stuff, imam. And then I joined MAPS in 2017 and moved here to, to Washington. And um, the uh, amazing thing about it is that I really loved this community and being a part of it. And um, I actually got introduced to Holden Village when I first arrived here. Um, and I, I met uh, Pastor Terry Kylo. And he told me about Holden and he said that, hey, this would be something great we could do together. We'll have an interfaith week. You know, we'll share our faiths with the, with the people at Holden Village. And I was, <laughs> I, I Google, I, I put it into Google. I said, okay, Holden Village, how do I get there? And it said no route found. And never have I ever put anything into Google Maps where it said no route found. So that was definitely something new. And I was a bit, I was a bit worried. I got a bit worried. Like, where does this pastor want to take me, me and my family uh, in the middle of the mountains in Washington? And I was new still. So I didn't really know uh, about Holden or anything. Um, and I Googled it, I researched it, I said, you know what, it sounds like a, like a good place, and uh, it seems like I can trust Pastor Terry. Um, and so we, uh, we, we came to Holden in, I believe it was 2018, the summer, and we had a brilliant time. Um, my kid, uh, my young son, Khalil, he was, I think, one or two at the time, and my wife, Badia, as well. Um, and after that, we went again in 2019 to Holden. Had an amazing time again. Um, and for this third time, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we're doing it online. Um, a lot of people ask me how I got to, to MAPS, how I got to the mosque. It, was it um, something that you get kind of ordained and you get sent over? Um, well, there's no ordainment process. All it is is that you have your degree, you have your qualifications, and you apply to this position just like any other position. So. Um, I sent my resume, I got references, I got an introduction, and through that I was able to, to get this position uh, at MAPS uh, at the mosque in Redmond. Today's uh, program is just an introduction. I've been asked to present my entire faith in just, uh, in just an hour, so I'm going to try my best to, <laughs> to stick to that time and to, to do my best to, to present the very basics and the very introductory kind of things about my faith that I think everyone should know. Um, this is a faith that is shared by 1.5 billion people worldwide. It's a, that's one fifth of all people on this earth. Um, it's this, this faith is what inspires me to be the best person I can be in every part of my life. Um, this is not a, a, an exercise in proselytization or anything. It's me sharing my faith and uh, with you all um, uh, hoping that it'll, uh, it'll, It'll give you that solid foundation when it comes to this faith. 
So the, some of the uh, key words that I wanted to introduce you to today, um, the first one is the word Allah, which is the Arabic word for God. And I think some people um, have this misconception that this is just Allah is just the Muslim God. It's just the God of Islam. When in fact, Christians who speak Arabic, so if you were to pick up a copy of the Bible, um, of the of the Christian Bible, in Arabic, you'll find that it uses the word Allah for God. Allah comes from Al-Ilah, which means literally the God. So uh, as an Arabic teacher, um, that's part of my, my, my joy is teaching Arabic. And it comes from Al-Ilah, which means the God, literally. So that is wh who Allah is, the Arabic word for God. <clears throat> and now, although uh, this presentation is, I hope to share some of, uh, some of the foundational things about my faith. And I think you'll notice there's a lot of similarities between our faiths. And that's what I le learned staying at Holland Village, interacting with my Jewish and Christian brothers and sisters. Um, I've learned a lot about how similar we are. We do have some differences and we can acknowledge those differences as a part of this work um, because this work doesn't mean that, hey, uh, we, are, uh, we agree on every single thing and we should all be the same. That's not what this work is about. This work is about acknowledging the differences. This is about uh, showing that compassion towards each other based on a common understanding. Uh, the other key word is Islam, which is a monotheistic faith based on the belief in one God and his prophets. So we believe in one God and we believe in his prophets. And the key word for that is Islam, the religion of Islam. And then the third key word is Muslims. So I am a Muslim. I believe in Islam. I practice Islam. So Islam believes in many prophets. You might notice that you know some of these names. You've heard these names before. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Jonas, Moses, David, Elias, John, and Jesus. P peace be upon them all. When we say their names, we say peace be upon them all. And we, we believe that the, the final prophet of God was Muhammad, peace be upon him. We also believe that Jesus, our belief in Jesus, we, we love him. We love his mother. And we believe that he was, he, 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 he was born... Um, uh, that, that Mary had a, a virgin birth to Jesus. And we believe that he was a prophet like these other prophets and that uh, he was given a message by God, a book by God. We believe in all of that as Muslims, um, as those who believe in Islam. We believe that Jesus is a very honored individual in our faith. Um, we also believe that Muhammad is a prophet like Jesus and Moses before him, uh, who was given a book. And we believe that this is the final message from God. Um, and that's because if someone was to ask, well, why Muhammad? Well, we believe that Muhammad was the final message. Um, and we believe that he was in uh, amongst this line of prophets that God had sent over history. And that God, for uh, in his infinite wisdom, decided that that uh, he was he, that his that he would choose Muhammad to be his final messenger, um, and that that was the right time to have the final message, and that's why we believe that uh, Muhammad himself. A quick intro, a quick biography, a, a one-minute biography. He was born in 571 A.D. in Mecca, which is uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. He was an orphan. Uh, he was an illiterate merchant. He could not read or write. He was known as the most honest and trustworthy amongst his people. He received revelation at the age of 40 from angel Gabriel. So Gabriel, we believed Gabriel went to Moses. He went to Jesus and Gabriel also and went to Mary. And uh, he also went to Muhammad and he gave revelation to Muhammad in the form of a book. And that book, uh, it was an orally transmitted book to Muhammad. And then Muhammad's scribes would write it down. Um, the early believers were persecuted for 13 years in that hometown of Mecca. He was he and all of his, all of his fellow believers were chased out of their town. So there's a lot of parallels there with Moses, who was who also had to leave Egypt, um, and then he established the Muslim city in Medina, uh, and that's not to be confused with Medina. Although I think there is a is a connect there is a connection there in terms of how Medina became to 
to be uh, known as Medina, Washington, um, but Medina, he established this Muslim city and uh, 10 years later he passed away. Um, so the, the book that we believe in as Muslims is called the Quran. Um, it is around 600 pages, so it's not too voluminous, it's not very large. And um, it's very common for Muslims to actually memorize the Quran cover to cover. It's very common for, for young people to spend some time memorizing it. And if not cover to cover, at least uh, many parts of it. And we'll, we believe that that's part of the, the preservation of the book, that it's not only written down, but it's also in the hearts of people. So that throughout history, whenever there were times when books were burned and, and, and knowledge was lost, that the Quran would never be lost because it is still in the hearts of people. Um, and so that's been part of our tradition. And we believe that the Arabic, the, the original Arabic of the Quran is the same Arabic that was given to, to the Prophet Muhammad. And we believe that those are the direct uh, words of God um, in that language, that that was the language that God had chosen. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that Arabs are better than everyone else, but what that means is that was the, the choice that God made that that was the best choice that, that there could be. And the Arabic language is an incredibly deep language. It's a beautiful language. And it's something that uh, all Muslims would love to, to understand and know. Not all Muslims understand it. Uh, not all Muslims uh, are able to have that opportunity to study it like I did where I went overseas and studied. And this is, again, classical Arabic. It's not modern Arabic. It's classical Arabic, uh, the language of the Quran. Um, and so I would say maybe 10, 10 to 20 percent of Muslims probably understand the original text of the Quran and everyone else usually depends on a translation or um, a teacher to, 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 to explain it and to, to comment on it. Um, and that's where, that's where imams come in as teachers, um, really. So we believe that there's this this one Quran, there's just one version, it is preserved in its original Arabic language. Um, it's filled with, with beautiful verses, uh, inspiring stories, useful lessons, all guiding us to be good people. I wanted to recite one, uh, one, one chapter called Surah from it for you. And so I'll do that now. It is called Surah Al-Asr, which means the verse of time, um, the chapter of time. And in this uh, chapter, God swears by time and how mankind is all at loss, all of mankind is at loss, except for those who believe, do good deeds, and advise each other towards good, advise each other towards patience and truth. So I will go ahead and recite that now, just like I do in my prayers at my mosque as the Imam. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. So that is the recitation of the Quran. Um, you can YouTube Quran recitation if you'd like to hear more. Um, there's many great reciters who you can choose from who recite the Quran as we do in the prayer. So now I'll go over Islam's core practices. Um, these are the, they're known as the five pillars of Islam. And so it's this common framework that helps us to understand the very basics of Islam. Um, and, and there's also a few other things, but that, that's, that's mainly, mainly it. So the first pillar of Islam is the declaration of faith. Um, and it is also translated as testimony of faith. It, it, the Arabic word for it is shahada, so testimony or declaration. Um, it can be translated different ways. That's one of the th issues with translation that it, there's, you know, uh, or one of the good things that you can have multiple, multiple meanings. Um, and it, the basic testimony of faith, and this is if someone wanted to enter Islam. Um, this is what they would simply recite. They would recite the, the Arabic and the English of this, which is Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except God, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. So that's the declaration of faith, and that's a part, a core practice of our religion. That if someone wants to enter this faith, that's what they 
they simply have to recite that declaration. Um, we also have the second pillar, which is prayer. And you might have seen people praying before. Um, this picture is actually of, uh, of Xi'an Muslims in China. And so that shows how diverse Muslims are actually. Um, you know, people, when they think of Muslims, they think, oh, they, Muslims are all Arab. I'm not Arab. My parents are originally from Pakistan. My dad moved to study at the University of Houston in 1971. Um, so it's not that Muslims are all Arab. Actually, only 15% of Muslims are Arab. And the rest of Muslims are from all over the world, China, Africa, everywhere, all around the world, Europe. Um, and um, there's, 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 there's Muslims in all, all around the world, and we're a very diverse group. Um, and so the prayer, the significance of the prayer is that um, it is a combination of the prayers and the kind of verses from the Quran, and also it is a physical, there's a physical part to it as well. So you might have seen Muslims standing in prayer, bowing in prayer, where they bend at the hip down uh, in a kind of L kind of shape. And then also in prostration, where we put our actual heads onto the ground, onto the earth, and we bend all the way down. It's a very vulnerable position. Um, and it, it shows that humility to God, that this, that this intellect that we that we value so much, uh, um, we are in submission to God in that form, in that prayer. And we pray, we're supposed to pray five times a day. Uh, obviously, everyone varies in their level of practice, so not all Muslims pray five times a day, but that is a general kind of re a practice of Islam that Islam not only encourages but requires Muslims to do. Of course, everyone has their own varying levels of faith. And so you'll see people standing. Um, it's possible to pray individually. It's possible to pray in groups. So if you want to pray in a group at the mosque, you may. If you want to pray individually at work, you may. Because there's five prayer times, and they're based on the movement of the sun. And so once that prayer time comes in, then you have a certain amount of time till the next prayer where you can complete that prayer. And so by prayer, we mean the specific physical form of prayer. Um, and uh, in terms of praying to God and asking God, um, that's part of this prayer, but we refer to that more as supplication. So where we raise our hands and we ask God for something, we call that supplication in Arabic dua. And um, in terms of prayer, we refer that to the specific movements that we do five times a day. Um, and the timings for those prayers are again based on the sun. So the first prayer is in the early morning before the sun rises. The second one, so that's really early in the summer in Washington, right? It's like 3 a.m., really, really early. Um, we just passed the solstice, so it was the longest day of the year, right? So really early in the morning, um, easier in the winter. The second prayer is at noon or right after noon. The third prayer is when the, the sun is halfway through its decline. The fourth one is when uh, at sunset. And the fifth one is at night. So those are the five prayers every day um, that Muslims are meant to complete. And they each take about five minutes between the standing, the bowing, and the prostrating. And so the, the, the part of it is this idea of unity that Muslims must stand together shoulder to shoulder and um, they're one community and there's a discipline to it. There's humility to it. Um, there's even this physical movement aspect to it that you're, 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 you're even stretching yourself, you know, you're stretching, you're going up and down. And so you're having a physical movement um, and taking a break from the busy lifestyle that we have today. I think it's an important thing for us to take a break. Um, I know a lot of people talk about meditation. So this would be a form of meditation for us. That's a part of our faith that we take those five minutes out of our busy day to start the day with prayer, to end the day with prayer, to start our work with prayer, to finish our work with prayer. Uh, we return home, we pray at, at sunset. So throughout those days. And so someone might say, well, how do you have to keep going outside? Looking at the sun is very hard to do it in Washington. Well, actually, we all have our mobile app, our favorite, whatever Islamic mobile app that tells us all the prayer times uh, by zip code or by area, it tells you. So we do use technology. 
Another thing about the prayer is that um, everyone, when they pray, they face Mecca, which is in present day Saudi Arabia. Um, but aside from Saudi Arabia's politics, um, you know, it's more about that location and that special location, which we believe uh, Abraham started, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and so all Muslims pray towards Mecca. And we also use our technology to, to find, uh, to use the compass in our apps that tell us exactly where Mecca is. Before that, we used to use compasses or we knew the general direction based on where we lived. Um, but now it's a lot easier with the use of technology for you to be anywhere and just to, with the little swivel of your phone, we're all used to doing that to find the direction to Mecca. And it's not, it doesn't have to be an exact to the degree or nth degree um, direction, but as long as it's within the 30 degrees or 20 degrees, something like that, as long as you're in the general direction, then it's acceptable. Um, so that's the, that's the second pillar, second pillar of the five pillars of Islam, the core practices. The third, the third is known as the zakat. And this is, um, zakat literally means purity, purification. And so the idea is that every year Muslims give two and a half percent of their saved wealth, not their income, but their saved wealth, whatever their savings are. When you're younger, that's a lot less. When you're older, that's a lot more. Um, and so you give two and a half percent of your savings uh, in charity, excluding your home, excluding the things you use every day, your car, um, um, but including your, your savings include your business inventory, um, your, your stocks and your stocks in the stock market and so on. And so you have your, your zakat that you must give. And I know Elizabeth Warren, uh, back when she was running, was talking about a wealth tax of about 3%. And that's what Muslims are already doing and have been doing for 1400, over 1400 years is giving two and a half percent of their savings every year to those in need. Um, and it must be given to those in need. It's best if someone can, it's encouraged for someone to go out and find those people themselves um, or to trust it to an institution that they know is doing a good job of finding those in need and, 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 and making that happen. Um, so you'll find people who do it themselves. You'll find people who, who give it to an institution who facilitates the giving of zakat as well. Um, and so it must be to those in need. It can't be to your best friend. It can't be, unless he's, unless he's a needy person who doesn't have uh, enough to survive on. So it has to be to those that are poor, those that are living, um, you know, or, or not, don't have enough to, to feed themselves. The, um, the other thing about zakat is that it, it, it's, again, going back to this purification, that even though we try our best to earn our wealth and to spend it in an ethical and principled way, there can be things that corrupt it. We could invest in a stock, and we don't know, actually know what that company is up to um, in terms of earning the, their profits. Um, it could be that even though we don't mean to cheat someone, we don't mean to take advantage of them. It could be because of the way a contract is structured or the way something happens that, that you know, there's some shortcomings there. And so that zakat is this idea of purification. Obviously, if someone steals wealth, they can't just give two and a half percent of it. If someone steals it, that stolen wealth must be returned. Because in our faith, we believe in the rights of people. We believe in the rights of God and the rights of people. And the rights of God, you can ask God for forgiveness because you didn't pray on time, because you, uh, because you, um, you know, said something wrong about God. But you can't seek forgiveness from God for something when you hurt people. When you hurt people, you have to go to that person and seek forgiveness from that person, return uh, and try to undo the harm as best as you can. That's a part of that forgiveness. Um, <clears throat> and so the next, um, the next pillar of Islam is fasting in the month of Ramadan. And you might have heard of that. Ramadan was this year, it was um, in May of 2020. And you might notice that it moves because maybe maybe a few years ago when you heard about it, it was in August. And that's because the, the Islamic calendar is actually the lunar calendar, similar to, to the Jewish calendar. It's a lunar calendar. It's based on the cycles of the moon. And so the moon, when every time there's a new moon, that's about 29 or 30 days, um, that's one month. And so then there's 12 months in the year. And so what ends up happening is that the lunar year ends up being about 10 days less than the solar year. So every year, the Islamic calendar moves back 10 days, moves back 10 days, it moves back 10 days. Uh, 
and my understanding of the Jewish calendar is that it, it catches up as well. Whereas in the Islamic calendar, we don't really have a mechanism of catching up to the solar. We kind of leave it independent. And so it, it just independently moves back 10 days every year. So when I was growing up, Ramadan was in February. It was in, it was in March. It was in, it was in the winter. I remember growing up and it was, it was cold when we were fasting. And now uh, the kids who grew up now are, uh, are fasting in the summer. And now they're like, oh, Ramadan's not in the summer anymore. I have to go to school and I'm fasting. I and mean, I'll talk about that. But so fasting, what is fasting? Basically fasting is when Muslims leave uh, food, drink, including water, um, and um, sexual relations from sunrise till sunset or from before sunrise till sunset. Um, and that ends up being around, in most places, around 14, 15 hours. I think in Washington, it's one of the longest fasts in the country, in the United States, um, nearly 18 hours. Uh, back when it was in June, it was even longer. In May, it was, it was, it was reasonable. And um, <clears throat> so the, the, the fasting, it, it's, it's, all, it's all day long. And so we eat before we fast, and then we eat after we finish the fast, after the sunset. And then also in the evening, we make... Uh, evening prayers at the mosque and so you'll see the mosque normally we might get 30 people 40 people at night for the for the last prayer of the night um and in ramadan we'll get we'll get hundreds of people hundreds of people coming every single night we actually had to coordinate every year with the city and to give them a, a little bit of a training to the police department to wherever else about hey you can expect this much traffic in this area um so that you don't get surprised um, for 30 days and, and they're used to it and they know about it now obviously uh, because our mosque has been running now for over 10 years um, so anyway so the fasting in Ramadan what is the purpose of it 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 it's this idea of being closer to God this idea of I remember my hunger and so that reminds me that I'm in a state of fasting that reminds me that I'm doing this for God that reminds me of God so instead of just being God in those five times a day, now it's an entire day, isn't it? Every time I feel that hunger, I'm like, I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this for God. And so it reminds me of God. It helps me to be God conscious. Uh, it, 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 it helps me to, to discipline myself. And the idea is that if in Ramadan, you can stay away from those things which are normally okay for you, then outside of Ramadan, it helps you to avoid those things which are unethical and unprincipled and, um, and are, <clears throat> are not encouraged and discouraged in Islam. And uh, the other thing about fasting is it encourages a sense of empathy with those that go hungry throughout, throughout the world, those that are involuntarily fasting in, in a sense. Um, so you give those, those things up, that food and water and so on. Um, so there's that outward sense of fasting. There's also this inward sense that the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that, that um, that there are many who fast who only get hunger and thirst out of their fast. And he was criticizing those who may give up water and, and food, but they don't curb their anger. They don't curb their envy or their greed or their lust or their gossip. And so he was encouraging us to have this inward sense of fasting so that we are not violent. We are, ang uh, we are not angry. We work on our anger if we have anger issues. We work on our envy if, we have, if that's an issue, our greed, uh, gossip. Um, and we try to cultivate mercy, kindness, restraint, generosity, honesty. Um, and there are exemptions for this. I know you're probably wondering about that. Yes, kids don't have to, to, to fast. The old don't have to fast. The weak don't have to fast. So if a doctor says, hey, you shouldn't fast, then you shouldn't fast. You take that doctor's advice. Um, if you're pregnant, usually if you're pregnant, you don't fast. If you're nursing, you don't fast. Um, if you're sick, you don't fast. If you're traveling, you don't fast. So there's plenty of exemptions for this to be a practice and uh, something that's actually possible for people to, once that, once it's, once, if you're not exempt, then it is possible for you to fast. That's the idea. Um, so it's only for those that are physically able. Um, so it's that time of Ramadan. Every, people love Ramadan. It's this time of community. Um, you know, growing up, I remember we used to have delicious food in Ramadan, right? I, my parents would prepare a feast every night. Um, so a lot of people have those kinds of emotions when it comes to Ramadan. It's a time of community. You see your friends every night. 
uh, for the evening prayer. And as kids, we used to just pray a little bit and then we used to play football. That was our, <laughs> that was our pastime. And so we used to look forward to Ramadan, not because of the prayer and the fasting, but because we'll get to play football every single night with our friends, you know, at night. So that's, that, that's, that was fun for us. Um, the, so we believe, so what's so great about Ramadan? Why Ramadan? So we believe that in this month, the Quran was revealed, the Quran being the book of, of Muslims, that this was when the, the Quran was first revealed to Muhammad. <clears throat> and at the end of Ramadan, we have something called Eid. And Eid is a celebration. Eid simply means celebration. There's two Eids. One of them is at the end of Ramadan, and one of them is at the end of the Hajj, the pilgrimage, which I'll talk about next. And we believe that fasting is something that, again, helps us to discipline, to, to be God conscious, to be thankful for what we have. Um, going along with the concept of charity, the concept of prayer being something that's a day long. Ramadan is a great time for us to leave old, old bad habits behind and to, uh, to, to bring on new, new good habits. Um, because I think even per self-development books, they talk about doing something for 30 days. I know some say 20, some say 40 days, but 30 days you do something is very likely that that thing will become a habit for you. It'll become easy for you. So people take the month of Ramadan to read the Quran, to, to pray, and to try to build those habits for the rest of the year. The fifth prayer, uh, the, sorry, the fifth pillar um, of Islam, core practice, is the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca. And um, so you have some pillars of Islam like prayer, which are required once uh, one, uh, five times a day. You have zakat, which is once a year. You have Ramadan, which is 30 days for once, once a year. And you have the Hajj. Um, and this is required just once in a lifetime. And this idea is that as Muslims, if we are physically and financially able, that we must make the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca once in our lifetime. And so because of this requirement, um, 2 million people go, at least 2 million Muslims go to perform Hajj in the city of Mecca every single year. Um, and it's, it's a... It's a requirement, again, once in a lifetime. And we believe that when we perform the Hajj, that we are following in the footsteps of Abraham, our, our father Abraham, um, the father of, uh, of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so we're following his footsteps um, when he left his son uh, by the command of God and his mother, Hagar, and, and Ishmael in a des des desert land, which was Mecca. And there, um, Hajar, she was running between, we believe, uh, we call her Hajar in Arabic. We believe that she was running between two mountains, two hills, looking for water. And so we symbolically follow his mother and we run between these two hills, um, search. And we, don't, we're not, we're, we know where the water is, but she didn't know. And we, we do it seven times, actually. Uh, to, to follow in her footsteps, um, which is, you know, something very unique that we're following in the footsteps of a woman. That's not a normal thing in many faiths, right? And so we believe that's, that's incredibly unique. It's a 10-day challenge. We go from place to place in Mecca, uh, moving all these people. Obviously, it's an enormous logistical challenge, um, but they do it year after year. And um, it ends within another Eid, um, my, uh, my parents have gone, uh, I've gone to the lesser pilgrimage, which is called Umrah. It's at a different, you can go at any other time of the year and it's called lesser pilgrimage. But if you go for this specific pilgrimage where all the people gather, it's a specific time, about 10 days in the year where you're meant to go, um, at the end of the Islamic calendar. And at the end of it, we have a celebration. Um, and so that's something that we go out in the morning and that's something we all celebrate, whether we're going for the pilgrimage or not. Where we go, we pray, we pray together in our mosque, and that's the day. That's like that's like Christmas or Easter prayer services, where it's the most packed day of the year, where you have Muslims who don't normally come to the mosque who come to the mosque at least for that Eid celebration, which is again at the end of Ramadan, one of them, and the other one is at the end of the Hajj. So this year, actually, there is no Hajj. It's only for locals. They've announced this year. Um, they took a while to announce it. Um, and during COVID-19, it's been completely empty. So it's a very sad sight. It's a very humbling sight to see, powerful sight, honestly, of, of what we're going through as a, 
as as one common humanity in terms of avoiding being sick and so that's what that's what it looks like right now during covid-19 but otherwise it looks like this with millions of people um and so we'll see what happens next year you know people are up people are upset they're not able to make pilgrimage this year but you know they understand why and 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 they're looking forward to being able to go the following year and so those are the five core practices and teachings of islam in addition to that i wanted to talk about this word sharia everything you have just learned prayer charity fasting pilgrimage this is all part of the sharia sharia simply means islamic teachings i know it's become a bit of a buzzword especially on places on news networks like fox news it's become a bit of a buzzword sharia law um sharia means islamic teachings so sharia law is like saying la la because sharia means law islamic law islamic teachings um and all the things that you have heard those are all part of the sharia in arabic sharia means path to water so in the desert the path to water is more valuable than anything else more valuable than the path to oil more valuable than anything else is the path to water and that's what sharia means these islamic teachings are guidance for us as muslims and um that is simply what we call the sharia and i think the sharia has a uh, gotten a bad rap because of i think um unfair propaganda um and an entire industry dedicated towards creating fear uh, unfortunately because people know that when we are afraid that we were we're willing to accept anything that someone does because of that fear so anyone who claims that they can get rid of this fear then um we, we as humans we have this within our nature to 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 trust them to do that and to get rid of that fear for us so unfortunately there's an entire industry that's creating that fear unfortunately and you can read about that and my colleague anila afzali she's done a lot of work on that pastor terry he's done a lot of work on that as well and i think i thank him for his his partnership on that the sharia is based on wisdom this is a quote from imam al qayyim um a 14th century scholar who was um who was a great scholar of islam and he's very looked up to by all muslims and so he said about the sharia that it is based on wisdom and the pursuit of the welfare of humanity it is entirely just wise beneficial and merciful now listen to this anything that veers from justice into injustice from mercy to its opposite from wisdom to foolishness and from the welfare of humanity to its harm is not part of the sharia even if it has been included therein by misinterpretation so that's a beautiful those are beautiful words explaining what the sharia is to us as muslims that it is something just wise beneficial and merciful and so for someone to claim that it is unjust or that it is not merciful or that it is foolish um that's hurtful to us and it goes against exactly what we know of it to be um another common question is about compulsion in religion the quran which is our guide and which we take to be the word of god um for us to follow in our life says let there be no compulsion in religion the arabic la ikraha fi din truth stands out clear from error whoever rejects evil and believes in god has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that never breaks in chapter 2 verse 256 we also believe in the struggle to do good we believe that doing good can be a struggle sometimes and that the word for struggle in arabic is jihad that the greatest jihad is to battle your own soul um and to fight the evil within yourself that's what the prophet muhammad peace be upon him said he said the most excellent jihad meaning the most excellent struggle to do good is when one speaks a true word in the presence of a tyrannical ruler so speaking truth to power is a great struggle and one of the most beloved struggles to god um because it's not easy to speak the truth to a terrible ruler in the response to violence the quran says whoever kills a soul it is as if they have slain all humanity to respond with peace in the face of hostility to fight only those who fight you and do not commit aggression and i think that third verse is usually taken out of context where people just look at fight they just say oh fight look the quran says fight no it says fight only those who fight you and don't go over overboard do not commit aggression to where in defending yourself you become the aggressor god commands you to treat with compassion and justice those who do not fight you so there's a commandment to treat with compassion and justice in the quran um 
the Prophet Muhammad, he said, beware whoever is cruel and harsh to a non-Muslim minority, curtailing their rights, overburdening them or stealing from them. I will complain to God about that person on the day of judgment. I'm sure there's many Christians who don't agree with the government of so-called Christian countries. Um, in Greece, until, re- uh, uh, you know, even as recently, um, 10% of the parliament is, is neo-Nazis, right? And they claim to be a Christian country. I'm sure Christians don't agree with that. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's, there's Jews who don't agree with everything that Israel does. Uh, similarly, Muslims don't agree with Saudi Arabia, their governments, or the Iran or Egypt governments. There's lots of things that those governments do that Muslims don't agree with and that aren't in line with the way that we believe our faith to be. Um, the, another thing about uh, Islam that we believe in is, is diversity. And that's something that uh, you even see in the diversity of Muslims in the United States. Um, you see that Muslims are the most, the most diverse group in America, consisting of white, black, Hispanic, Asian, um, with all kinds of different groups amongst the Muslims in terms of racial and ethnic backgrounds. And that goes back to what the Quran says about mankind. That, all oh, mankind, we created you from male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. Um, God, uh, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said in his final sermon, he gave a final sermon at, at the last Hajj pilgrimage that he did to Mecca once it became safe for him to go there um, in, his, in his final years. That all of mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab. And, and, and note that he said this to a group of you know, majority 90% Arabs. Um, that an Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab over an Arab a white person has no superiority over a black person, nor does a black person have any superiority over a white person, except by piety and good action. This is a verse from the Quran in, uh, at, the, at the Harvard Law School faculty where my colleague Anila went to school. All you who believe stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God, to Allah, even against yourselves or your parents or your kin, and whether it be rich or poor, for Allah can best protect both. So stand firmly for justice, even if it is against yourself and your own parents, your own relatives, whether they are rich or poor, right? Whether the victim is rich or poor, whether the aggressor is rich or poor, it shouldn't matter. We should stand out firmly for justice. And that's easier said than done, isn't it? Usually people of a higher status get certain, get certain, um, so certain things are forgiven for, let's just say, for people of a higher status, socioeconomic background. And so the Quran reminds us over and over to stand out firmly for justice, regardless of who the, the aggressor is um, or the one that is committing that injustice, the oppressor is. And that's something that we at our mosque, we try to do. We try to stand f- firmly for justice. This is me and a few members of my mosque at the, um, at the, the Poor People's Campaign that took place in Olympia. And we continue to try to be a part of uh, our, our community and our society. A third of our annual budget at the mosque um, goes towards charitable causes for all that benefit not only Muslims, but non-Muslims as well. We believe in respecting all creation. There's a famous story about how a very sinful person um, gave water to a thirsty dog. And as a result of that, as a result of that one act of, of kindness to a dog, um, in other narrations of that story, a, a cat. So a dog or a cat for you dog and cat people, um, just giving water to that thirsty animal became a means for that person's sins to be forgiven and that person to be entered into heaven. And so a simple act like that, we believe, is what it takes to earn God's forgiveness. And that's how much we want people to respect animals and to respect God's creation, whether it be the trees, whether it be the animals, and so on. Um, We also believe in forgiveness. This was Rais Buyan. He was shot in the face by a man who, after 9-11, blamed Rais, who was simply working at, he was just a clerk at a gas station. And he came in with a shotgun. He asked him if he was Muslim. And before he could respond, 
he shot him in the face and he had to be hospitalized it was uh, luckily he was he didn't he didn't die he 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 survived and they were able to um remove the the bullets but he did lose vision in one eye he did lose vision in one eye and he actually fought to take the perpetrator off of death row and to to not execute him unfortunately the government still went on with that and the man was executed but rais fought for his forgiveness and here's the man on the phone with rais um seeking his forgiveness and rais giving him his forgiveness and that's part of that's part of uh what god teaches us is to be forgiving uh, not to be taken advantage of but when we are in a position of of helping someone and of teaching them right from wrong then to 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 give that forgiveness is can be very powerful um and there's many examples of this that i could give but due to time i'm going to to move on from from this slide uh the prophet muhammad he said i protect christians wherever they may be on land or sea in east and west in north and south they are under my protection within my covenant and under my security against all harm and so that's something i think that really calls out to uh how the prophet muhammad felt about christians and christianity and i think that's something that i want to be able to um to also hold up in my life is to have that relationship with my christian brothers and sisters my jewish brothers and brothers and sisters um because of our common humanity and i think as you may have seen that we share so many similarities and yes we do have some differences when it comes to jesus when it comes to things like that and some creed and theology and so on all let the theologians handle those issues and have those theoretical debates but when it comes to real life when it comes to every day when it comes to being your neighbor when it comes to to having that common humanity i think we have so much in common and so much to share and so much to learn from each other and so i pray that we are able to to build that relationship and we're able to build that compassion for each other not just tolerance right tolerance i feel is something bare minimum but we're really having that compassion and that love for our common humanity and for our shared similarities um and even for our differences so let's stay connected if you have any questions about this presentation anything that was said um i'm sure i didn't do it justice in the time that i was given but let's stay connected please email me adam.jamal@mapsredmond.org feel free to visit our website look around um at our facebook page we have our our live prayer services every single friday you can tune in it's on our facebook page um uh, you can join our newsletter on the website simply scroll down and insert your email and you'll get everything i send to the to the whole muslim community you will get as well and so you'll be able to see what we're up to and how you can participate even during times of covid-19 we're not letting it beat us we're continuing to be active as much as we can in online way um and so i hope that you'll join us i hope that you'll visit us and that's it from me today um and i hope i'll i'll see you around assalamu alaikum peace be upon you